welcome to the show. This is The Magician and the Fool podcast episode number 39. Today we speak with Mr. Eric Perdue. Eric is a practitioner of medieval astrology and Lakumi. He has studied metaphysics and magic for over 30 years with a particular focus on practical planetary and folk magic, and he lives in Seattle, Washington. We will be talking about Mr. Perdue's new translation of Henry Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. Eric's been working on this for about a decade, I think, at least, and he's put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to put out this definitive version of this really monumental work. This isn't going to be an Agrippa 101 episode, so uh, just be aware of that. We kind of just dive right into some really nerdy territory right from the start, and then we just keep going with it. Um, I would recommend uh, our last guest, Dr. Justin Sledge. He has a fantastic video on Agrippa, which um, hopefully I'll link somewhere if I remember. Um, Otherwise, just go to Dr. Sledge's YouTube channel, Esoterica, and look up his Agrippa episode. We're just going to get right into it, but first I want to say thank you to our longtime and new Patreon supporters for the very, very generous support, which helps keep the lights on here. So making a podcast isn't free, and it isn't necessarily easy. I mean, I'm doing this at midnight right now when I really should be sleeping. But it's a labor of love, as we always say. It really is. We dedicate this to Hermes and Asclepius, and may the merits we accumulate doing this work be distributed to all sentient beings, so that they, together with us, may equally realize awakening. Okay, we are here with Mr. Eric Perdue, author, scholar, practitioner, heir to the chicken farming empire. No, Different spelling. <laughs> <laughs> Spelled like the university, not the chickens. <laughs> okay, good to know. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so glad to have you on. Excited to talk to you. Same here. Yeah, this book has been a long time coming. You know that better than anyone else. Yeah, it's giving me more gray hair. (laughs) (laughs) So we are going to talk about this new book. This is the uh, three books by Agrippa, new translation by Eric Perdue. Um, Like I said, very anticipated new translation, much needed. And we're going to talk about why it is very needed. But before we really get into the book, um, maybe you can you know, briefly tell the audience how you got started on your esoteric path. Back in kindergarten. <laughs> no, uh, I've always been interested in uh, history and mythology since I was, since I can remember. <laughs> and things heated up probably shortly before I graduated high school. And I knew that I wanted to get more into magic and I had, I knew nothing. I knew that I knew nothing. And so I did what everybody else or, or most of us at least have done. Um, I you know, looked into Wicca a bit. I read Starhawk. <laughs> you heard it here first. I read Starhawk, and um, I started looking into you know Alistair Crowley, Golden Dawn, and all that. And I really wanted to get into some of the Golden Dawn stuff. I knew nobody, and at the time I was doing, I was in a band, or not? Wasn't in a band. I was playing music though. And I met someone who I played with for a little while. And he says, well, there's this, I think I might know somebody. And um, he was very mysterious about it. 
I said, what does he do? And he goes, well, he does, you know, Egyptian things. And he, um, you know, when you, when you join his temple, you have to shave your head. And he was, you know, all this kind of very mysterious sounding things. So he gave me his phone number. The guy had, you know, the, the, the man whose number he was giving me had this exotic sounding name. And so he gave me his number and I said, what do I tell him? And he said, well, tell him you want to make an appointment. And I said, about what? <laughs> he says, he'll know what you mean. So I'm like, okay, this is like a drug deal. So, <laughs> so I called him and, you know, he had a sort of a light, almost English accent, aristocratic accent. And I said, you know, is this, is this Ordun? And he goes speaking. And I said, I got your number from a friend and I want to make an appointment. And he said, for what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I was like I have no idea, no idea. So anyway, he we talked a little bit, and he goes, "Fine, just come come on over such and such a day." So we talked, went over there, we talked. Um, you know, at the time, this is in uh, probably 1990, um, before the internet. He had one of the only shops in Chicago where you could buy like bulk incense, herbs, that kind of thing, and his, his shop was. Um, by appointment, but when you went in there, it was like a 19th century apothecary. So you walk in there and it was kind of dark. And with these, it is exactly like what you'd think of in the movies and these shelves with large jars full of stuff, cool. mysterious looking things. And he had a 19th century style cash register even. And um, <clears throat> so we sat in this room and talked for hours. And then finally he said, do you trust me? And I'm like, uh, so far you seem fine. And, he, this is going to sound funny. So he, he, he basically pushed on the wall and a secret door opened up. He, and I found out later, he really, he's, he's like secret doors. You know, he, had, he had a couple of them. <laughs> wow. That's so rad. It is. Yeah. Um, his office had one too. So, you know, so we opened up and it went to another room and it, it was Egyptian. I have pictures. I've, I've posted pictures of it in, in, on Facebook with a life-size statue of ISIS with taxidermist eyes in there. So they kind of looked at you, you know? Hmm. And he sat down and gave me a Lukumi de Lagoon reading and um, didn't know what he was doing. And suddenly he proceeded to tell me <laughs> things I never told anybody. So it was a interesting reading. And I, and it was detailed. It was, you know, concrete things he was telling me uh, at that point. I said, okay, I want whatever this guy has. And he, there was, there was no, there wasn't one word about Lukumi or Santeria or African, anything. Um, he kept things very generic. And uh, so over uh, the course of a few weeks, he kind of gradually trickled more information. And by the time I figured out it was leukemia, it was, I hadn't really heard much about it, but I heard of it. And um, by that, I kind of figured it out. I mean, did you think and, you were getting into some kind of Egyptian yeah, stuff? Neo-pagan, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it started out, he originally opened that up as a neo-pagan temple. He was one of the early neo-pagans. And um, like he, you know, we're talking uh, mid '60s. He started that. He was in uh, Drawing Down the Moon, that book. I don't know if you've seen it mm -hmm. uh, by Adler. He was just, I think, he was just. He finished his year after initiation when he, when he did that book. But yeah, he, his story was that it started out as a neo pagan temple, and his teacher died. So he, the way he said the story was that he started, He was he was looking for a tradition that had oracles and initiations and lineages and that kind of thing. And then he stumbled upon leukemia. Well, I found out later on he was born in Havana. <laughs> so, cause there, there was no, if you speak to him or saw him, there was no hint that he was really Hispanic necessarily hmm. um, or Latin, you know, ancestry. Cause he was, he was, you know, he was white and had a kind of an English accent. So he brought in leukemia and he, 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 he did it on its own terms, basically. So, you know, we were doing misas, you know, with a crucifix <laughs> on the table and all these neo-pagans freaked out. And a lot of neo a lot of them left at that point because mm -hmm. they were trying to get away from the crucifixes. Right. Uh, anyway, so I did it for several years. He, he was, you know, because of his roots too, he, he, he's the one who introduced me to Agrippa uh, and astrology. You know, he was doing modern astrology, just like what typical stuff you see. So yeah, great. He, he introduced me to Picatrix. He didn't have a copy of it. Um, so he hadn't read it. He just kind of knew about it, knew what was, what it contained. Uh, so he was very sympathetic to the idea of planetary magic. And he did, 
a kind of planetary magic as much as he could sort of figure out on his own from books. So it wasn't anything like what you would see today. And um, so, I, you know, I was kind of warmed up to that idea. Just, I, I wasn't really impressed by astrology at all. Um, Cause I, I would see what people would do and they were, you know, it was just these kind of vague, Oh, in the next, next three months, um, it's, it's, it's going to be really kind of low energy time. And I'm like, <laughs> like, okay, what do I do with that? Um, but I was very impressed by the Lukumi uh, De Lagoon. The De Lagoon readings, since a lot of people don't know, are done with um, small cowrie shells about the size of, I don't know, maybe half an inch, or about the size of a, of a garbanzo bean or something a little larger. Um, and you use 16 of those. So you get 200, uh, up to 256 signs that can come up. It can get very detailed. <clears throat> so I was very impressed by that because I was getting concrete information and I was not seeing that in astrology at all. And so after he passed away in 2005, I decided to go back, go back to my roots and read up more on kind of the Western stuff. And I remember him talking about Agrippa a lot. So I bought three books of occult philosophy and you know, I, I, I read it from cover to cover and I realized the astrology he was talking about wasn't anywhere close to what I was hearing. And there wasn't much on the internet about traditional astrology back then. Uh, Chris Warnock was around um, and Leigh Lehman and people like that. And um, so there was enough to get, you know, kind of get me pointed on the road. And I learned about William Lilly. So I bought Christian astrology, which I still highly recommend. And I realized that that, that astrology is closer to what I was looking for because it, you know, since you can now do concrete readings with that. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah. It got me started now. So I, I started doing, I found Picatrix shortly after my godfather passed. And I was kind of pissed off that I found it. Cause I'm like, man, if you could have seen this, you know, he would have gone nuts. Hmm. Uh, and that was my first attempt at translating something. And it was a, before Chris Warnock and John Michael Greer published theirs. And I actually, I went through a first draft. I think I did the first, I think it was on book three. But then I discovered they were doing it. And um, and almost done with it. And so I gave up and I'm like, okay, I'm going to let them do it because it was, I, I didn't really completely understand the astrological terms as much as I thought I did. The animals and plants, plant names are pretty difficult in Picatrix. So I was, I was happy to not have that responsibility. <laughs> I'm sure you learned a lot doing that though. I did. Yeah. That's, 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 you know, I always start big. Um, <laughs> and uh, then a few years later I started uh, three books so three books is very ambitious. We were talking yeah, earlier. It's, it's I wasn't thinking that way though. <laughs> it was. Pr- it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big project. So I mean, what made you think you'd be able to do that, or what? What was the motivation to do that one? Um, well, I, I already knew that there were a couple of errors with the astrology, and it got me wondering how, how much more there was in the book that you just couldn't tell from reading the English. So I wasn't originally intending to do the whole book. I picked a couple of ones that I knew that were wrong just to see how the Latin looked. And then I started doing, I just started with the first book. I mean, sorry, the first chapter just to see how it went yeah, and see how it compared because there's really nothing terribly crazy in the first couple chapters. And um, I found errors already. <laughs> I think it was in chapter. I don't know. I can't remember. It was the one where he was talking about the elements. That's probably what fourth or fifth chapter, something like that. I found errors in there and I'm like, oh, okay, how deep does this go? Yeah. So I just, I just kept going and I really, I didn't really think about publishing it. I didn't really think of people wanting to read it. Uh, and then I, I was talking to Chris Warnock off the cuff one day and he just goes, uh, dude, you have to, you have to publish this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he thought I was going to finish it. I was going to say, and those errors are in the original Latin, right? Or the translation from the original Latin or are they in the Latin as well? Okay. So, very generally, there are exceptions. The Latin's pretty good. Um, there are a couple of errors, not that many. Most of it is the the original English translation. So there, there's a couple of levels. So one of the things that I don't think is really apparent to a lot of people is that Agrippa, the vast majority of three books is quoted from other texts. I, I don't know the percentage, but I'm going to be conservative and say three quarters of it. Um, I think it's actually more than that. So there's that. So there's there are some issues on occasion with the books that Agrippa is translating, um, quoting from. Not that many. There's a couple errors, 
And there are a couple of times when Agrippa did mistranscribe something or it's a printer error. We can't tell which one mm-hmm. it is. But then the English translator, I, I don't, we don't know who the English translator is. It's, it's JF is the official name. I'm trying to think if I have it straight in my head. Uh, I think the con- it's commonly thought of as James Freak, which I'm so glad that's not my last name. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and I think Tyson proposed that it could be James French, who is an, uh, a little known alchemist. I think I have it. That's correct. I may have it flipped. But the bottom line is we don't really know for sure who it is. But whoever JF is does not seem to have known the astrology very well. And he mostly translated the philosophical texts pretty well and mostly did the Kabbalistic material pretty well. But there's, there are a lot of errors with the astrology. I mean, these are words. So the, the English translation was in 1651. So this is, you know, pretty much right in the sweet spot for the little mini Renaissance that happened in England with astrology. And there were a lot of uh, English books being written on astrology at that time. And I think, Lily was even still alive at that point. So there, there should have been a no, there should have been no trouble like getting these things translated correctly. And he, and very basic terms he didn't get. Then to compound this, you have Donald Tyson's version where, you know, and this isn't, you know, I'm not saying this to bad mouth Tyson, but when he did, but uh, <laughs> no, uh, but when he published the first edition of Agrippa, um, the critical edition had only been out for maybe a year. So he may not have known about it at that point. And the other thing, which is definitely true, is the state of our knowledge of traditional astrology was not very good at that point. Because really, the, this, this interest in traditional astrology, now tr- traditional, I mean, you know, for all the, view, uh, all the viewers out there or listeners. So usually tr- traditional astrology is defined as pre-1700s. Um, that's a very rough date. And there are a lot of exceptions, but if we're generalizing, 1700. And there was a kind of uh, resurgence that had a re- rediscovery that happened in England in the 80s by Olivia Barclay, uh, where she started doing um, horror re astrology from um, William Lilly. But really, by the 90s, there was still there was still wasn't much. There was like Lilly and the English authors. And that was it. And it wasn't until the 2000s when really things started ramping up. Um, so now we have, you know, Ben Dykes doing his Arabic and, and Latin translations, and he's the big one. <laughs> uh, James Holden did a ton um, that were released in the early 2000s, maybe very late 90s. So all this stuff came out after Tyson did Agrippa. So even the things that JF did correctly, um, Tyson's ability to really figure out what a lot of these things meant just wasn't there yet. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that for the astrology, he mostly was looking at Ptolemy and anybody who studies a lot of of traditional astrology knows that Ptolemy is kind of, you know, he's kind of a rogue. Uh, So he has his own thing kind of of going on. So you can't necessarily read Ptolemy and think, and and think that that's going to be representative of astrology as a whole. It it wasn't. So it it gets, it gets very muddled. I mean, and then, you know, Tyson had his whole chicken company and he probably didn't care to sell all that. <laughs> you know what? No, no, oh, I didn't that's think the about competitor. that. Okay. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. So you had the Purdue and Tyson. That's that's horrible. <laughs> now and, and and now Marcus McCoy has do has more fuel <laughs> to troll <Yes>. me. <laughs> um but yeah, the issue with like, so, Ty- so Tyson, you know, due to this kind of, yeah, you know, again, it's not really all his fault, but, but, you know, due to a variety of factors, <laughs> you know, Tyson didn't read the, the original Latin. So he, in the introduction, he, he said that he had a copy of the Opera Omnia uh, of, of Agrippa's, but he didn't really read it. So you have a lot of compounding. So you'd have JF would make an error. And then Tyson, not knowing that I was an error <laughs> in some cases, would then have a footnote saying, well, here's, here's what this error is talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and then it would go off into something different that has nothing to do with what the original Latin said. So the implications of that are pretty significant for practitioners, I would Yeah, I would assume, especially I mean, if you're doing astrology. Yeah. Uh, if you're trying to do the astro- any astrological election, according to what uh, Agrippa is saying. Yeah. And um, there are a few illustrations that are also flipped, uh, which should drive... You know, any magician that likes sigils, 
that should you know trigger them. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, so much of that magic in the book it has some kind of link to astrology that it's a significant thing. Yeah, the the Kabbalistic material is pretty good. Um, one of the strange things about the I, I don't really. I'm not a Kabbalist by any stretch of the imagination, but one of the strange things was in a lot of the sections where he has, you know, these lengthy Hebrew um, sentences, a lot of times Agrippa's Hebrew is different than the source, but the Latin around it is the same. Hmm. And I don't really, I don't really understand why that's the case. And in the, the parts that I can, I can sort of, I can sort of understand um, appear to still be correct. Uh, that seems to be one of the few things that a grip had changed. I, I, I haven't answered that for myself, why that would be the case. Um, Interesting. A lot of it comes from one, two, from two sources. One is um, Franciscus uh, Dior, uh, Giorgio, uh, Harmonia Mundi. And the other one is Roy Klin, who's pretty well known. And in all cases, he'll, he'll quote the Latin faithfully, and then the, then the Hebrew just becomes something different. Hmm. Yeah, so... Um... So aside from the astrology and some of those, so what are some of the other um, sif- significant changes that we're going to see in this in this new edition? I know the animal and uh, kind of botanical names yeah. are are updated, which is great. They're updated in some cases, uh, corrected. Um, there are some that we'll never know. Yeah, I, I don't think Agrippa knew all of them. To be honest with you, it's like for instance, he you know he he quotes a lot from uh, Pliny the Elder. And, um, you know, no one's translated that, you know, some of these names and there's really no reason to believe that Agrippa knew them either, but there are some really strange cases where, you know, JF would translate, I think it was Amber in one case translated it as jet. That's bizarre. Yeah. And I don't really, I think it was Amber. Why? why? I don't know. (laughs) And, uh, I did find in, um, this is something I had to dig into. I didn't, I didn't even know it was wrong was uh well, was two things in it was uh, uh in the fixed star uh the substance the you know the the instances and stones for the fixed stars and one of them i think it was regulus everybody translated the stone as granite and i initially translated it as granite and the one day i was looking at it and i'm like wait a minute that's not granite and so just like in english so it found out it was garnet wow and that's a, wow that's a huge difference yeah in the Latin and the English, just just like just like in English, the 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 word for granite and, and the word for garnet, it's it's almost the same, and it's just one letter different. Um, another one I found was um, I can't remember what star it is, but they or maybe it might have been a, a lunar mansion, but I think it was a star where they translated the incense as I think it was, actually it was a mansion. They they translated the incense as carob, and and this isn't even just JF. I'm talking. Everybody translates it as that. And at first, I'm like, like a carob is a little weird, but I've seen weird ingredients and incense before. Sure. But it was bugging me because the word really wasn't showing up anywhere, like in the normal dictionaries. It was carabe, which is very close to carob. So I started digging, and I there was a, I'm not going to name names, but it's a popular website that has, that sells a lot of materials. And they translated carabe as asphaltum. So I messaged them and I said, well, where'd you get that from? <laughs> mm-hmm. And he goes, Oh, I got it from this, you know, 19th century, you know, apothecary uh, book. And am I saying that right? Anyway, um, so. it's on Google. So he gave me the link. I looked at it. Sure enough, this, this 19th century book has it. And then I started asking myself, okay, where did they get it from? So I started digging and I found out that it was a regional term for Amber. Um, that's all around like part of, it's part of, uh, you know, basically the region between like France and Spain. So thus we have the scriptorial game of telephone in full effect. Yep. Yeah. And again, if you if if someone out there subscribes to you know magical sympathy, um, that paradigm, and you're using something, you're using granite instead of garnet. I mean, right. That could be a game changer. Maybe I, I have feelings though about this. Like mm-hmm. over, I mean, in all the astrological forums, well, I guess I, I guess it's supposed to be magic because. Other astrologers don't argue about this. People, or, or just in magic in general, hoodoo, um, folk magic, people argue endlessly about materials. Mm-hmm. And I really, I mean, just from my leukemia experience, I kind of wonder about that sometimes. I'm like, well, I mean, like, you know, we do OB divination, you know, for with coconuts, and OB is technically colonet. 
but in Cuba, they use coconut. And to a modern practitioner, you look at that and be like, okay, we're using the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm like, well, yeah, it's been working for hundreds of years now. <laughs> and I, it, it makes you kind of wonder that, you know, I, I question how much Agrippa knew some of the terms he was using or anybody knew some of the terms they were using. Um, a lot of times, you know, they were, they were, they were just like translating things or, or passing on things just over and over and over again. Plenty of the elders is a perfect example. I, I can't think of the, ter- of the word right now, um, but, you know, he mentions a stone that's supposed to gather spirits and no one knows what that stone is. And this is not coming from Agrippa's experience. I mean, he probably, he didn't know what the stone was either. Um, and there, and, there, and there are cases probably also that he knew that we don't know, but, but this endless arguing about, you know, can the magic work with granite? You know, probably. I mean, if you, if you can't get garnet, I mean, it, it's not hard to get garnet, but <laughs> that's a pretty easy one to get. But, you know, how, it's, 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 you know, what if, what if granite is the only thing you have, or, you know, you're supposed to carve the sigil for algal and a diamond. I mean, how many people are, how, how many people are using diamonds? Yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> I mean, I think when you're dealing with sympathy, if it's something in the same line of sympathy, then it should it should be acceptable. But I know, like, if you do some divination to see if that will be acceptable, that's a that's the best practice, in my opinion. Is like, okay, do I have the substitution? Is it is is it within that line of sympathy? Okay, so let me divine for it and see if it's going to be accepted. Well, and, and how do we know that these list of substances that we were using, how do we know that that wasn't mistranscribed somewhere? Right. And I mean, really the bottom, the, the big gulf of, you know, traditional magic and astrology to us today is that they grew up in, a, I mean, they lived in a, in a world that took the existence of spirit as a given. And in our world, we, you know, I, I think pretty much all of us grew up in a scientific mindset that's what we went to school for to learn. And so, you know, when you start working with spiritual practices, there's always this little part of your brain. That's like, okay, is this, is this really my imagination Mm -hmm. (laughs) or is this a spirit? I I mean, people have had imaginations since there's been people, but, but I, I, but we, we second guess the spiritual angle of it so much that we put an over-reliance on things that are not spiritual, such as the material. And, yeah, what you're saying about the divination is part of it, but a lot of people don't even think to take that step. Well, because I was thinking of like an Ebo, you know, you you do the divination to see if the Ebo will be accepted, you know, and that or what it's supposed some, to be. Yeah, or what it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the uh, and you know, an Ebo by the way, it's in Lukami is a um something that you do to fix to to accomplish something. So Literally, the word being sacrificed, but it's not always a set, not usually a sacrifice. It can be. Um, so, a bow could be uh, putting some fruit on the corner, for instance. But that has to be prescribed by spirit. And I think you're written off track there a little bit. But I see, I see these endless arguments about, like, you know, like for instance, a lot of grimmer magicians argue about going by the book, or you know, or whether or not there's a little bit more wiggle room there for you, and. Um, and, and that's and the argument is always about this kind of binary, you know, by the book or not by the book. And the, but the reality is it's, it's somewhere in the middle because the, the you know the grimoires are not fully sufficient on their own. First of all, second of all, we don't know what they did in, in practice all the time. The people who wrote the books, we have that problem with astrology. It's the same thing. I mean, everybody's arguing about these books, what people said, but with the exception of Lily and kind of Abu Mashar and a little bit of Banati, um, to a great extent, we don't know what they did during readings. A, a lot of this just becomes kind of academic arguing. <laughs> uh, well, and I think nothing. that goes back to what you were saying about the mindset. Um, it's hard because we, you're right, from a point where we can't even remember because it's also, it's not just through the school system, it's through our culture. We're inculcated right. with this materialistic, you know, this dogmatism of this materialistic, analytical, 
you know, rationalistic post enlightenment worldview that denies the existence of anything that is spiritual. So, unfortunately, as Westerners, we have to we have to you know uh, become as liberated as we can from that. I mean, I still experience the residue of that influence years and years after formally disavowing it and doing so much work. It's hard, and it, I, I think the only reason why I was able to do it <clears throat> was because I mean, I was nineteen when I first started practicing leukemia. And I was pretty quickly witnessing things that most people are just reading about in books. I'm not alone. I'm not saying I'm the only one. And then, I, I mean, anybody can, can do this, <laughs> by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to put myself apart there. But, but I, I did see things. Uh, you know, I, I went to drummings where people were possessed and telling you things about yourself that you never told anybody. Or doing things that they're not supposed to be able to do. And <clears throat> that, that made a pretty definite impression on me. So I, I basically had no doubt that there was spirit, that spirit was a, was not part of my, my psychology and in magic, magic and astrology pretty much, you know, really have twin histories here. I mean, they have very or parallel histories is a better word uh, more than most occultists and most astrologers want to admit. And the thing is, is that both, both were damaged um, by the enlightenment, the, the scientific enlightenment. And they both, you know, got steered into psychological models more or less for the same reason, you know, uh, to, and, and, uh, you know, in astrology's case, Alan Leo didn't want to get sued anymore. So he went psychological <laughs> and in magic's case was heavily influenced by theosophy that wanted to uh, distance themselves from uh, nitty gritty, you know, making things happen magic. Uh, and, and it became more about things like, vague things like enlightenment and, you know, uh, spiritual evolution and things like that. And that that's really been to our detriment. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of people when they get involved, when they get interested in magic, that's kind of really what they start out with and, and astrology too. That's what they, what they start out with. So there's just all this unlearning that you have to do. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to attack Agrippa as well, because Agrippa is one of the only sources that um, he doesn't tell you how to do magic. So he doesn't give you any of the recipes except for some of the incense. If you can get the eagle brains, I'm fresh out. <laughs> but, but for the most part, he doesn't tell you how to do the magic, uh, or what, or you know, what like what what steps that you take to do it. But he does tell you what magic is, and he tells you the means in which magic operates. And so a lot of people start reading Agrippa and then give up because, well, okay, I, I don't, I didn't learn how to conjure a demon from this book. Um, but I, I think that's more important because people, you know, magic and astrology are so technique focused when it comes to books and, um, and, and everybody's arguing about the technique, the proper technique. And, but at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, why are you doing this to begin with? <laughs> and, you know, what is a demon? You know, what is an angel or why are we using these terms to begin with? You know, all these things, you know, even though, you, you know, you may not like Agrippa's answer should at least get you started asking the right questions. Well, and ultimately it should all be about the direct experience and optimum effectiveness. I mean, when you have a direct experience of the immaterial, of the invisible, of the imaginal, when you have Congress with spirits, when you have interaction with these beings, there's no question. And, you know, the intellectualism is naturally quashed by any you know even one direct experience you know one experience of speaking to a spirit during a possession crisis or through a visionary dream that's enough to sh to show you that spirits exist but i think you need a little bit of both because you still have to think about what you i mean humans are analytical animals true and it isn't really one's better than the other and it's like you know that old argument armchair magicians versus not armchair magicians and the reality is that we all need to, we all need our armchairs at, at times. <laughs> um, and, you know, Agrippa is the perfect armchair material. Uh, I mean, the thing, the thing, the reason why I think this, this is important is that a grimoire tells you, it, it tells you the recipe basically. And almost every book that's published today, it tells you how to do things. Some of it's bullshit. Some of it's really good. Uh, but it's, it's basically, you know, they're going off of like a recipe approach to things. And, um, but the thing is, is that it's important to remember that, you know, your favorite grammar might be X, but that, that grew up in a particular time frame and culture. 
and worldview that we don't share today. And a lot of that worldview is still, it can still apply today. It is, I mean, you know, pe- people get flippant about it. They're like, okay, well, I'm not going to use leeches to cure myself or whatever. But, but the thing is, you know, these people did things with magic and they did things with astrology. So it's like, why not listen to them? Yeah. You know, take it, take it on those terms. Um, you know, easy examples, elements, for instance, you know, in, you know, we, you always hear about the four elements and, you know, in science, there are, I don't know how many elements there are, a lot of them. Um, I think the term is buttload. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of, but anyways, all these elements. And so people have a disconnect with the traditional elements. They're like, okay, well, we know that there's more than four elements. And yeah, I know that I'm not made of fire because <laughs> I'm not on fire. And and so, like, you know, so, you know, things like this, you know, they sort of tell you, okay, what, what the elements actually are doing here. You know, granted, Agrippa did not know about the existence of sodium, <laughs> but they weren't dumb. I mean, they, they still they still were accomplishing what they needed to accomplish, uh, but in a very educated way. A lot of this thing came out of like a of out of this. A lot of this stuff came out of a world by people who were educated in you know Plato and Aristotle and understood mathematics. I always think and this is actually more explicit, explicitly stated in, in Picatrix, but Agrippa kind of alludes to this. Well, Picatrix says that magic is uh, an analogy. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is this, like this is that kind of a thing. So what Picatrix says is that in order to learn magic, basically, you have to embark on a course of study. And you have to kind of, you know, basically you have to learn the, you know, in the Latin West, the quadrivium and the trivium. You had to learn geometry, mat- music, astronomy, everything, right? You, you had to learn all of these things. And they have a huge list. Um, That's not realistic for most of us today. You know, learn, you know, learn how to, the art of war, learn everything. Right. And, and then once you, once you finish this, this entire course of knowledge, you realize that magic is partially the sum of all that, but it's more at the same time. So you can't learn magic necessarily by studying all these things, but you can't know magic without studying those things at the same time. And, you know, if we're speaking literally, no, that's not true universally. You know, I, I mean, you know, my in my leukemia experience, do, do I think that that these elders were sitting there, said, you know, arguing about geometry? No, I don't think so. But the, but I think I think that the that if you take sort of the cultural element out of this and you think about what it's actually saying, that that you don't necessarily learn magic by reading magic books <laughs> uh, and books on magic. You know, you you learn magic by understanding the world around you. And how the world operates, and but you also but you, but you also have to work with the spirits at the same time, and all these are all these are working sort of in tandem with each other. Along those same lines, can someone just off the street pick up Agrippa's three books and use one of the sigils and the spells and have no background and have it work? What what are the no. prerequisites for this to work? Yeah, I don't think it would it can work that way because. And that's that's one of the things. I mean, you know, chaos magic it's is so sigil heavy, and now now this there's a sort of exaggerated importance placed on sigils, and so nowadays people are sharing sigils as if the sigils themselves have the power <laughs> to them. Um, but to Agrippa, so you're dealing with planetary magic, so you have to a know enough astrology or pay an astrologer to time the appropriate time for you to do these ceremonies. Um, it's, it's a, it's somewhat difficult to learn, but not a, it's, it, you, I mean, anybody can learn it, but it does take a lot of time and a lot of, you know, practice to do it. And then I, I, I think as far as those sigils go, you have to know what they represent. And I think, and I, this is kind of a recent thing I've learned. Um, there's a lot, there's quite a bit to imp- unpack about those sigils. I think Tyson gave up on a couple of the sigils where he said it, it was wrong uh, in his appendices. I found an, I found a um, a paper on the sigils published by the Warburg, Warburg Institute. Um, I can't think of the writer where he theorizes that the sigils are based on partially on chess. <laughs> Interesting. I haven't really internalized how that works though. So I'm just kind of saying those words right now, but he did show that, that the sigils work by you basically the, the lines have to are really going off the magic square. Like it's not all contained within the magic square, which is why some of them look kind of come out a little bit weird, but 
at the end of the day, you're doing a kind of, you know, uh, gematria or gematria. So there's that as well. And I, I'm a little bit, what I don't know is how they elicited all those names from those magic squares, but it is a kind of gematria. But the bottom line is, 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 you know, for the, for the beginner, you have to learn, you have to learn astrology um, or have access to an astrologer. <laughs> you have to know what it is that you're bringing down because he, he has said, you know, sigils for intelligences and JF translates them as demons or sorry, as spirits, Evil the spirits. Latin diamond. Yeah. So which one do you, do you use and for what reason? And Agrippa does not tell you in that chapter. Exactly. He tell he says that the intelligence is for good and the spirit slash diamond is for evil, but, um, but it's not that simple. And I mean, what's good and evil. <laughs> mm-hmm. What does that mean? Um, I have some opinions on that too, but, but the thing is, it's like, it, it's not, it's not as simple as just grabbing um, one chapter and then taking the information that you need, that you think you need. And then, and then going off on that because in the last chapter of Agrippa, <laughs> He says that he purposely uh, scattered some of the material and, and purposely left some of it vague. I don't know how much of it's him is him being a troll, <laughs> um, or how much he knew and didn't know. But the material is definitely scattered in some cases, and I mean, translating, you start noticing some of it. I was going to say, so it's a reference book, but it it shouldn't be a reference book at the same time. I mean, you should yeah, probably it, start from the beginning and go to the end if you're going to yep. do it right. The book is written is written the same way you would build a house, and he starts with very basic concepts. Uh, he starts out with, you know, what is magic? Which how many magic? How many books on magic written today start out with that? Defining what magic is. That's true. Um, then he goes to the elements, and then he, then he starts getting more complex from there. And um, first of all, I want, I want to complete my other thought, thoughts. So, you know, with scattering the material, there, there's it's a little bit more organized than it appears because you know, when you say that people think, okay, well, he's being disorganized, but I sort of think that the way you see some cookbooks where, you know, like let's say it's an Italian cookbook and they tell you how to make uh, you know, bolognese sauce and they'll say, okay, you take, you take some ground beef and you mix it with the marinara sauce from page, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, they're not going to repeat that recipe for every single time that it comes up. So, yeah, so Agrippa is basically doing that where he starts out with very basic concepts and then those get revisited. You know, things in book one might show up again in book three, but you're already familiar with that uh, concept if you read the book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's funny you mentioned the Bolognese thing because I just made one the other day, but... My spirits told me that. <laughs> they probably <laughs> did, though. <laughs> um, but the thing is, I was gonna, I was actually going to use Indian food as an analogy earlier because like, I like cooking Indian but I never realized until I started cooking Indian food how complicated it can be sometimes. And you have to do everything in exactly the right order. Mm-hmm. And you have to do, you, ha- you cannot deviate from certain basic steps. But yet, when you get used to those steps, you realize that's the foundation for several recipes. Yep. And that's like this. You know, yep. if you deviate from those or omit them, like something as simple as like, you know, fresh coriander versus like dried coriander powder and when you put it in is going to actually make a huge difference in the way the dish tastes and comes out. Yeah. And I was thinking that, you know, the, about the importance of philosophy, I always think of this, it's a old saying where, um, you know, intelligence tells you that that a tomato is a fruit. And then wisdom tells you that you don't put tomatoes in fruit salad. <laughs> and I think about that. I, I thought about that kind of thing a lot while working on this book and all the drafts that I've gone through with it is that, I don't know. I think some people get are uncomfortable reading philosophy sometimes because I think people don't want to be told how to think the real purpose of philosophy isn't to label yourself as a Neoplatonist or an Aristotelian or whatever. It's to teach you how to think. And so there are some things in a grip I don't necessarily agree with, but you know, I, I, you know, like for instance, like, you know, knowing the difference between a demon and angels, like what are those differences? If you're not, if you're not thinking, if you're not talking about the Bible here, what are the differences, you know? And, you know, those, that kind of knowledge helps you out. Cause I, I see, you know, on the internet, on internet forums, which are always a gold mine of 
cringe a lot of times. <laughs> um, That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> a gold mine of cr- a gold mine of, we should start a forum called that the gold mine of cringe. Let's um, do it. <laughs> um, hear that, Marcus? We have an idea. Um, no, but like, you know, people just argue these things endlessly. And I'm like, if you just start with actually reading this old, you know, some of this old material where it came from, you know, the, the, <laughs> you know, most of the grimoires, at least in the West were written by Catholics and, you know, people are uncomfortable with Catholicism, you know, today, a lot, a lot of occultists are trying to run away from Catholicism and here they are working with systems that were created by Catholics or not created, but written by at least Agrippa was a Catholic, you know, it's, but the thing is, is like, you, you should be able to like, place this somewhere in the universe for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are concepts that you should be able to understand and, and think about. And, you know, it's not, it's not as simple as, as just substituting one God for a different guy. It's like, okay, well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm a Buddhist. So I'm going to change it to Buddha, which doesn't really sound right. But anyway, um, it's not as simple as just substitution yet. I mean, you have to really intelligently think about like what is really needed or, you know, do, do I even believe in spirits to begin with? That, that's a that's a big thing that I see all the time. So I think, you know, like, you know, people doing being curse happy, for instance. You know, when people are curse happy, that may, that tells me they don't really believe magic works. Yes, we've you talked know? about this before. Oh, have you? <laughs> Amongst ourselves, yeah. It's like, um, you know, sort of like having a gun. You know, it's like, you know, do you, you know, are you, are, if you substituted that curse for a gun, are you really, you know, are you, do you feel good about shooting that that person? I mean, if you're from Florida, you do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Click, clack, rat, a tat. <laughs> I was going to say, um, you know, anybody hanging out with Trithemius, though, I mean, I've read some anecdotal accounts of him visibly conjuring spirits in, in the presence of his students. Yeah. You know, and uh, even in the presence of, I think, like, like servants, like maids or something. I mean, you know, when you have a teacher like that too, that's another thing is, you know, someone like Agrippa, he didn't come across this information randomly. I mean, the transmission of teacher to student is a huge thing. Yeah, there's that. And I mean, Agrippa does make allusions to things that he did himself. There are a few passages. One of the arguments I've heard is, is how much he was actually a practitioner. And I don't know the level of that. I don't know his level of knowledge with astrology because he's, you know, he's just quoting things. But every once in a while, the word I is in there. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, one of the things was, I mean, he, met, he, he did something with optics. Uh, he said he knew a way of, you know, seeing armies from a long way away. But um, I, I don't know how long he was with Trithemius. I think it was, you know, months maybe. But he, was, he did run around with a circle of uh, like-minded people. And I'm sure they did things. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, going back to something we were talking about earlier, um, being that you are a practitioner of both the Western, traditional Western esotericism, as well as traditional uh, African arts, how do you see those, those traditions interacting? Do you see any, I mean, are they compatible? Do you see any times when they are um, irreconcilably incompatible? Mm, well, when it comes to actual practice, I keep it very separate. Yeah. Um, but if we're talking about philosophically, yes, I do think that there's some similarities. There's actually a funny throwaway comment that he makes that uh, that you shouldn't cross your legs. And um, and that's actually something common in, in Mises and seances that we do in a spirit of teasing is that you don't, uh, you don't cross your legs or your arms. No, there's philosophically, yes. I, and I think that, that this helped me sort of intellectualize things a little bit. It's interesting because, you know, Agrippa is doing magic in a Catholic context and leukemy is African magic in a Catholic context, sort of, except you don't have the Catholicism isn't, isn't always necessary to be used. Really. It's Mm -hmm. not as prevalent as some people think. I'm not sure about voodoo, how prevalent it is. I know it's there, but, but yeah, it's an intellectualism. I think has been very helpful. Again, it's teaching how to think about it. Yeah. But I, I never, I, I never, never mix. I believe in taking things on their own terms. I don't elect. I don't do elections for leukemia ceremonies. <laughs> so back to the book. I'm sure most of our listeners are f- familiar with 
three books of occult philosophy, but can you, would you be able to break down the, what those three books are, you know, book mm-hmm. one, book two, book three? So the book is split. It, the, the, the volume is uh, divided into three parts, which are called books. And the first one is on the, is on the natural world. So that deals with the elements, uh, plants, animals, stones, that sort of thing. Um, second book is on the celestial world. So that deals with mathematics and astrology. Mathematics is part of that. Actually, mathematics shares uh, between the second and the third book. Um, and the third book is on the divine world, which, by the way, the three parts in, in Platonic thought. And the overall, the overall gist of the book is that Agrippa is – first and foremost, even though he's quoting other books, is doing so in such a way as to craft his own statement on what magic is. And he, par- he partially wanted to show that magic was part of the natural world. That was one reason, and not and not against the, uh, the teachings of Christianity, believe it or not. And he also just wanted to give a broad overview of magic's place in the world. He basically does this by quoting about 200 books. And most of these books are, were considered to be very mainstream books to the Renaissance uh, scholar. I would say 95% of those books you can find on Google books. I mean, it's not that they're not that hard to find really. Um, There's a couple notable ones I couldn't find. Like the one with the, the planetary sigils that is quoted from a book that I couldn't get. So I had to take the critical editions word for it on that one. Interesting. So, you know, all of his reference material. For the most part. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the critical edition helps out. I mean, they, they give the, almost all of them. And I did identify a couple of them, you know, due to the magic of the internet. And there's a few that's just unknown, like the instance recipes. I don't know where they came from. There might've been Agrippa's, but they, the, the instance recipes kind of follow the same logic as uh, Picatrix. Well, it's very similar to Petr- Picatrix in that Picatrix was a compilation of how many hundreds of, of other works. I think allegedly. they said 200. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you know Agrippa's use of Picatrix is a little bit different than I expected. Um, he so the 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 sections on the decans and the lunar mansions and the images of the of the planets you would think would come straight out of out of Picatrix, but they don't. And in the cases of the of the decans and the mansions, he uses he mixes up like three sources, and so he'll use. You know, I'm just going to make this up off the top of my head, but he, the like for the for the Deccans, he, he'll he'll have the effects of the Deccan, the magical effects of the Deccan that might come from one source, but then the image will come from a different source. Hmm. And he does a lot of kind of mixing things there. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't expect that. I thought it was going to be, and I, at first I thought it was just you know maybe he didn't understand it, but um, these are direct quotes, and. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a pretty good chance that the person he quoted from didn't probably got it, you know, off, but, um, and, and then he quotes like an obscure line out of the blue, out of Picatrix about how you have to measure a dead body like three times. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's it. I, kinda, I expected a lot more material, but I, I suspect that he didn't have a physical copy of it. I have a suspicion that he took notes hmm. and didn't actually have it or had extended use of it. Um, but even the Bible, he doesn't quote the Bible directly most of the time or Plato. It's usually from a, another source, which is interesting. You know, I know he had the Bible. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but he was using someone else's, like when he goes into the numbers, for instance, um, he'll, he'll talk about the number seven, which was my least favorite chapter, by the way. That was the most tedious thing. It goes on for like 7,000 pages. Um, but he goes through and lists every single time that the number seven uh, appears in the Bible. And uh, which is only three times. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> but what's interesting is you, you can tell by the, like sometimes like some of the order that he uses, uh, it's actually from a different book. So he didn't, he didn't really bother doing the research in the Bible necessarily. He just used someone else's distillation of it. He would have loved Google. Oh God. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> well, it's also, it's also interesting because he had a pretty interesting life. I mean, what is he was a soldier at one point. I mean, he was a soldier. He was a secret agent probably, but it, it's a secret. Uh, but I think he was most of the time he was a physician. He was a well-known scholar on Roycland. He taught 
Roiklin and universities, which can you imagine that today? It's amazing. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing that he was teaching Roiklin. I mean, that, that even right there, that's a transmission because of, you know, Roiklin was deeply involved in Kabbalism. Yeah. yeah but he, he wrote another book called, um, uh, the verbo memifico, which is like, you know, the on wonderful words, uh, which isn't quite as Kabbalistic. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I can't remember that one came out later though. People like to say, people like to talk on Roikland, but they don't realize he was a huge, Roikland was responsible for saving the lives of like thousands of Jews mm-hmm. in Europe. He basically defended them repeatedly and in such an eloquent way that he preserved them from being killed. I mean, he also constantly worked for interfaith dialogue. I mean, he was a really amazing person. And uh, I think it does say something that Agrippa was so not, you know, had studied him in, to such a deep degree. You know, we could say like, well, you know, at, to what extent did Roiklin influence Agrippa's ideas? A lot. I mean, he's so. Um, what's interesting is is there's there's a uh, there's a there's a, a manuscript of three books that was written and given to uh, Trothemius, and in the very first letter, I think it's the first letter in the book, Trothemius mentions that he received the letter and or the the draft and approved it. Uh, Agrippa wrote that when he was twenty seven. 27 yeah. <laughs> holy crap yeah you better step up um <laughs> <laughs> and um so anyway he you know he went on with his life did a whole bunch of stuff wrote some other books and uh towards the end of his life he had uh you know imperial privilege to publish a bunch of books so he um started publishing some books that he had already written sometime before um, some copies of three books had already been leaked uh, or some of the material he had. So he was really conscious of controlling the, the narrative. So he painstakingly went through and, and, and uh, he mostly lengthened the book. I think the original one was maybe, I don't know, a third the size, something hmm. like that. Um, but one of the, the, the two notable things that happened during the, that, and during that gap was that uh, a Roycklin published, uh, you know, on wonderful words, and the second one is Franciscus uh, Giorgio published uh, Harmonia Mundi, which is a little known book t- book today. It's physically larger than three books of occult philosophy, but probably a lot more. It's a lot more boring. Uh, I, I, I really think Agrippa got the best parts. Uh, Cause I was, I was tempted to translate it at one time and I started looking through it. And I'm like, this is kind of rough. I mean, it's really, <laughs> it's like all of the Jesus parts of Agrippa just like amplified to like, you know, 300 pages. <laughs> I just couldn't deal with it. Um, but most of, uh, most of Agrippa's like Kabbalistic material either comes from Moiklin or him. The, the, you know, the part where, you know, shows the proportions of the human body uh, that comes from Harmonia Mundi. Uh, it just goes on and on. But he, I would say that ballooned that book at least another hundred pages, 200 pages, just from quoting that book. Cool. So aside from probably never wanting to hear the name Agrippa again for the rest of your life, um, <laughs> do you do you feel like you have a pretty special bond or connection with him after spending so much time with, with his work and just yeah. kind of trudging through it it's, for so it, many years? I I do feel privileged to, to have done it. Um, yeah. I, really, I think that a translation like this couldn't have been done if that A, that critical edition wasn't out. And B, the internet wasn't around. It, those two things really made it easier. The, I, it just sounds corny, uh, but there are there are a few times when I was, was translating. I really, really did. I, I almost felt like he was there, you know. Yeah. Because there there were times I was translating it, and it was just like the certain parts of it just started flowing uh, differently. And um, the whether he was there or not, I don't know, but it, it, it felt that way sometimes. Well, in Buddhism, they would say that you connected to the mind stream of Agrippa. Could be. Could be. Um, if anybody lives in France, by the way, if you can get me some, uh, I don't know if the the convent that he was buried in is, is still exists, but I would love some grave dirt, some Agrippa grave dirt. <laughs> Any listeners in France? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, really what he did was it is so monumental what he did because the there are a lot of books that talk about magic. And there are a lot of books that talked about philosophy and you had some people like Ficino, who I love, 
who expounded on, on both of those things to a, a huge degree. But really, I mean, no one besides Agrippa before or since has packaged everything in, in, in that way and it's such a huge, I don't know, compendious work like that. You know, when you first say that he, you know, the, most of the book is quoted, people say, okay, well, it's, you know, it's plagiarism or whatever. But I don't know. I mean, try writing, uh, it was about 400 pages in Microsoft Word, uh, three books is. So you try writing that much, mostly by using books in your library and making it your own argument. Right. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Anybody can do that. But uh, yes, I'm sick of Agrippa. <laughs> <laughs> sick of his ass. <laughs> so, so one last thing I wanted to, I don't know about you, Janice, but one last thing I wanted to touch on was um, the issue of his retraction um, and your thoughts on that when he uh, kind of had, seemed to have had a change of heart later um and what was what was that all about i had a feeling that was going to come up <laughs> yeah yeah i had to i had to uh well first of all no one really knows that's that's the real answer but uh what i think so that comes from a book that was published actually in the same group of books that three books came out of uh called on the uncertainty of the, of the sciences the, the title is much longer so that that particular text is I, I don't know. I guess the word you could say is it's a, it's a satire. Um, what he's doing is basically showing how, showing the, that at the end of the day, we really don't know that humans really can never know. So we have all these sciences that we've created um, based on observation, based on study and based on whatever. But at the end of the day, we really don't know the, the real truth of anything. Uh, but he does this in a very sarcastic style. And he just basically goes through and picks apart uh, every element of human knowledge that he can think of and just, you know, kind of roasts it. And that, anyway, that's where that retraction came from. So what we don't know is if that's in there to roast himself um, or if he meant it or if he did it to protect himself. We don't know. True. Um, what we do know is that while he was writing that retraction, he was working on three books of occult philosophy. Right. So um, all those things definitely came in together. He had a knack though of escaping persecution. Um, he happened to, yeah, he, he knew the right people. So he would get in trouble for something and then just, you know, barely get away with it. Um, except the enemies went in prison for debts. I don't think people understand. They don't have a, they don't have a way to compare what it was like back then. I mean, this getting thrown in prison thing was a real possibility if you yep. were a magician in those days, if you were an open magician. I mean, it happened to almost all of them, and some of them did, didn't bounce back. No. Yeah, he he um, happened to know the right people, and he, he had a habit of pissing people off. Um, he probably wasn't very diplomatic. I do have a feeling that he was a true believer in, in Catholicism. And I think he was a true believer in what he wrote. And I think that he was one of those people that believes it so strongly that he naively believes that everybody else thinks the same way he does, or does, or if someone doesn't understand it, it's because they just simply don't understand yet. So if he explains it to them, then they're going to believe what he believes. And I kind of feel that about him. And uh, because he, 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 he tended to kind of uh, uh, mage explain uh, a lot of people and it would piss them off. Um, and he, and he, he did come under formal inquiry a few times. Um, but he just barely, he barely missed it. And he, he eventually when he did go to jail was over debts, not over magic. And if you think about it, this, I mean, Apuleius was put to this kind of scrutiny. If we go even further back mm -hmm. or, you know, more contemporaneously, I mean, you know, um, Bruno, Kelly, uh, Cagliostro, Pico. Pico. I mean, when yeah. you read this stuff, I don't know. It always pisses me off, and I just think of the indignity and how insulting it must have felt to be put before these imbeciles and have to attempt to defend yourself, for, and at the same time do so in a way that that they will understand and not hold suspect. I mean, it's like impossible. I mean, well, it's like it's like talking to Congress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's like a> <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean people these days we have so much freedom now even freedom to to 
misinform ourselves. Back then, it wasn't like that. It was dangerous. It was like a Wild West. <laughs> yeah, sort of. I mean, the, the advantage of back then that you could disappear. Yeah. It's, it's not possible today to disappear. <laughs> I'll just go to Italy for a little while and until this blows over. <laughs> I mean, I think that's one of the reasons Paracelsus kept on the move on the move because he had a notoriously big mouth. Yeah, uh, Agrippa did keep on the movie. He he was he went. I, there, there, he even spent a short time uh, with Henry VIII. I think it was yeah, uh, for like five minutes. All right, guys. Well, we have a hard stop coming up. We definitely could keep going, but we want to thank you, Eric, for coming on, and we want to uh, point people in your direction. So, uh, what do you got going on? Where could they find you? And what do you offer? Okay. Uh, well, my website is very difficult to remember. It's ericperdue.com. Spelled like university, not the chicken. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, on that site, I do, I do astrological uh, consultations. And I have a few different things that I do on there. And the book is going to be published uh, by Inner Traditions. And it is on their website. So you can, you can do pre-orders from that. Uh, eventually when I have physical copies, I will probably be selling some from my site. Cool. Um, that's too early for all that. So when's it, when's it due out? November 16th. Okay. So we got a little ways, but uh, yeah, it still feels very abstract to me because we're still editing. <laughs> well, and, and you know, I know it's going to be beautiful because in our traditions, they put out some beautiful books and the books are nice quality, good paper, everything. So I'm pretty I'm sure. This will... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think this will be an addition that will last on the bookshelf and stay in good shape too. I hope so. I mean, the editing, that, the, the amount of editing that we're doing is pretty uncommon for the, for the uh, occult press <laughs> world. Um, well, we went through, I think, four formal edits before it even went to Inner Traditions. Wow. And they were still finding tons of things. Wow. So... There's still going to be mistakes, I'm sure, when it gets published. But well, there's a, there's a lot to go through. Oh God, I I, I can't even see the the errors anymore. I'm I'm, I'm become text blind <laughs> at this point. I want to mention too. I know somebody very well that got an astrological reading from Eric, and all they did was rave and rave about it. Seriously, <laughs> he's uh he's just known for being definitely on his game with his astrology. Um, I I def I know he comes highly highly recommended and. I would inc- I would give him this stamp of approval from the magician and the fool, and you guys know that I'm usually highly critical of people. So for me to give a positive <laughs> review means they must be good. And also because I promised, I also want to give a shout out to, to Marcus uh, McCoy, who uh, you guys interviewed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we love Marcus. Yeah, he's been a major cheerleader now, and I, I really this book probably wouldn't be published. Uh, like this, if it wasn't for you know him and uh, and some, you know, I also have other friends too. But he's been he's been a big cheerleader and kind of, you know, abusing me into getting this thing out into the public. So awesome. Well, hopefully you guys <laughs> will bring back the brothers unconnected. You guys need to make some more episodes of that podcast. We literally talked about that this week. Nice. Yeah. See your spirits. You know. <laughs> the spirits are listen. The spirits are screaming for it, man. People are in the streets. They're in the streets asking for this. But I did. It that just reminded me of something I wanted to mention. You know, when we were talking about spirits earlier, I, as, an, as an aside, um, you know, spirits have a culture, too. Yep. And, and I think, that, you know, they're not these automatons that fly around just magically wish granting. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> spirits are spirits are people. They have a culture. And I think that that's another important part of uh interacting with them and getting to know them is understanding their culture and learning their culture and, you know, having that same sort of reverence and respect when you come to a new country or, or you encounter a new culture, you know, and you have to learn the language and learn the customs and understand, you know, the, the nuances of, of the cultural uh, exchange. And uh, you probably aren't going to learn that from, uh, from the web. Very true. <laughs> and probably not from a lot of books, but I mean, that's, that's the not on armchair part of it, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Eric. It's, it's been really a delight having you on your well, thank you. person. Yeah. And we we're excited about your book and we're excited about your future work. And we're excited about you as a human being. At <laughs> <laughs> least for acknowledging for, that I'm a human yeah. being. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Eric, for coming on. We we loved having you on. Oh, thanks for having me. And if you ever want me back, I'll I'll be there. We'd Absolutely. love to. Yeah. We should really, you should really come back for it. We'll do a Lakumi episode. I'd love to hear more about your experiences in that world. Okay. I can ramble about that too. It sounds great. <laughs> All right, that was Eric Perdue. Uh, he is now done with his uh, phenomenal translation of Agrippa. Um, this is a huge, this is a milestone in esoteric literature for the period we're in right now. We needed a really up to date, you know, solid, solid, like a rock <laughs> translation. <laughs> Agrippa. And now we have one. And this is good because there's some very technical passages in there. And Eric is just a phenomenal person too. He's great, funny, smart, cool guy, um, knows what he's doing, understands the subject matter, and he understands traditional astrology. And a lot of the three books of occult philosophy um, deal with astrological considerations. So it's important to be able to understand some of these sort of specific and at times nuanced you know nuanced aspects of traditional astrology in order to fully grasp the magical paradigm um that this the compendium is presenting i mean i have tyson's big black brick and um it is it is still i think useful as a resource but honestly i am anticipating that Purdue's work is just going to frankly blow it out of the water yeah, no, I can't wait. And this is this is a big deal. Um, it's kind of crazy to think that there hasn't been a translation like this done yet. I wish him all the success with this. I'm pretty confident it's going to be very successful. And yeah, it was fun talking to Eric. He's just a fun, laid back dude. Um, we had a Good sense of humor. yeah, we had a lot of laughs. It was just a fun interview. And uh, yeah, he knows his stuff. We didn't emphasize it enough, maybe that he is a He's the real deal when it comes to uh, traditional astrology. He's put in a lot of hours, um, a lot of time and energy in his craft. So I uh, definitely need to give him props for all that. So what book do you have for us this week? I am reviewing an excellent book by Caitlin Matthews called Untold Tarot. In this book, Caitlin exercises a survey of cardamantic techniques of interpretation uh, pre-modern cardamantic techniques of interpretation for the tarot. As a reader of 29 years, this information is uh, definitely, I feel, very pertinent. She goes also into the older understanding and interpretation of the trumps, which are really based on the different sets of virtues, classical and Christian. And she explains that in uh, part of the book. Um, additionally, she provides different sort of techniques, which would have been somewhat standard knowledge for a cardomancer of, you know, some hundreds of years ago. Um, but in today's modern milieu are relegated to the wayside, to the fringes, or to other systems of cardomantic interpretation, like um, with Lenormand or Kipper Carton or Zaguna or anything like that, even with playing cards. She employs these techniques to gain further knowledge and uh, insight from the tarot deck as a divinatory instrument. I found it to be a useful book. Uh, I definitely learned some things from this book. I mean, Kaylin Matthews is a, is a fountainhead of knowledge as is her, as is her husband. And um, um, this book is both practical and theoretical. So you get some history and theory, which is nice. And then you get practical techniques of interpretation and it's a handy little book. It's not huge. So it's the kind of thing you can pop in your bag um, and go somewhere and practice with or um, study for a refresher, you know, in the park or something, um, just enjoying the nice weather in the spring. I definitely recommend it Uh, as a reader. I have a serious bias against so-called intuitive reading. Um, Although intuition is deeply important in divination it should always be secondary to um, the skillful employment of traditional techniques in, a, in any system. Today, there has been too much emphasis placed on quote-unquote intuition 
And what that you what that ends up really looking like with many readers is an over reliance on really their own subconscious projections, as well as character reading and uh, face reading and body language reading if they're in front of someone. So in essence, a combination of cold reading and subconscious projection and reliance on biases built from personal uh, anecdotal experiences. It's not genuinely intuition, but it's sort of a gestalt, gestalt of those things I find with many more inexperienced readers. And they attempt to clothe this inexperience under the moniker of intuitive, which also does intuition a disservice because intuition properly is a function of the whole psyche. And it is, uh, it is essentially, in my opinion, um, a function of the unconscious mind, as well as an expression of clairvoyant uh, perception, which transcends um, the personal identity. Because intuition has a clairvoyant dimension, it is actually a minority of diviners who are able to accurately use it. And the cards do not need this. You could actually be the you know about as psychic as a as a brick and still be able to interpret tarot uh, as well as other systems like Lenormand and uh, so on and so forth. If you understand the traditional techniques of interpretation and the traditional meanings of the cards and the underlying structure of the system, this is essential. And Caitlin's book, she assists with that. So I strongly recommend it. And I also strongly recommend that if you are a diviner or if you're choosing to go to a diviner, whether that be me or another person, that you're, uh, you carefully investigate them and determine whether their knowledge and understanding of the cards or whatever system they use. And, you know, there's many systems of divination out there, but the key is you should attempt to uh, develop an awareness of whether they have a grasp of the actual system. Um, because that is really what's essential with Tarot. You could read Tarot with no intuition whatsoever if you understand the system and you understand the cards and you understand the symbols and you understand the significance of other elements in reading and give a spot-on accurate reading every time because the cards do not need intuition. They are correct on their own. Um, so with that said, I want to recommend this book. And um, I also wanted to include a few caveats on divination, which is a personal passion of mine. Cool. What's the name of the book again? Untold Tarot by Caitlin Matthews. Awesome. Sounds sounds great. And uh, thanks for the little uh, monologue there. That was interesting too. Okay. So we are done for the day. And uh, you can find us as always on Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, uh, everywhere else. And so uh, that'll be it for now. And we hope you enjoyed the episode. And we will see you next time.